Hello and welcome to In Conversation. My guest today is the eminent author and artist, Sean McNiff. Sean, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining me today. Wonderful my- to be here with you, James. Oh, thanks again, Sean. And, and might I begin by inquiring where you're joining us from? I'm I'm in a, a village called Anasquam, which is part of Gloucester, Massachusetts, uh, about 32 miles north of Boston on the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, well, I wanted to begin by asking you a little bit about um, about your home there in Massachusetts, because I know from reading your work and and and, and from being familiar with your art as well that. You're a man who's traveled the world and you've you've had many different roles, but it seems like you've spent a lot of your time being based in Massachusetts. So what is it about Massachusetts that you love so much? Well, I was uh, born not far from where I'm living, and uh, I just like the region. I grew up in a city called Salem, and um, and, and and I've always, uh, in, you know, greatly appreciated the region. I went to college in New York City, came back again. That's a whole other story. I write about it, I think, in Art is Medicine, a little bit of the personal history. And uh, I think one of the really things was that stabilizing things about being here is me starting a graduate program when I was 26 years old in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And of course, that exploded and took off and that, that reinforced the ties to the region. It's um, It's been said, of course, that you have a seminal influence on areas such as creative enhancement, the arts and healing, and of course, arts-based research. I um, believe you've published around 15 books on the topic. You have, of course, been involved as the editor of the Journal of Applied Arts and Health, um, and have had a great impact on, on the field. But I want to take it back, and especially as you've just mentioned some of your early formative educational experiences there, going to New York and things of that nature. But let's take it back a little bit further. I just wanted to ask you, can you remember what was your your sort of first memory of the of the arts? Um, can you remember maybe the first gallery you went to, or any early influences and and and, and the formative experiences in the arts? Well, I'd be happy to address that, James. But one thing I want to say is I was I've never been the editor of the journal. Oh. That is, of course, the truly eminent uh, editor in chief. <laughs> Ross uh, W. Pryor, and I've been on the editorial board of the journal uh, from its inception and been working and supporting him and Mitchell Cossack and Teresa and the whole intellect team going back to Masood in the very beginning. Oh, my mistake. Well, look, we're, we're, gonna, we're yeah. definitely going to talk about Ross and, uh, and, 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 and the team and their, their <laughs> vital, vital important role. Uh, then there's me thinking that you were involved on the editorial team back in the day. But I think editorial but, team, editorial well, board, I get my, my, myself mixed up sometimes. Well, I was very, I, I certainly want to answer your question, but uh, Ross, uh, Ross came to me at the beginning as he was starting the journal and I just supported it uh, with all my heart, and we'll talk uh, more about that, supported it and him. But in terms of early uh, early beginnings, you know, the most honest story I could tell is, as a child, my mother would always take uh, my pictures that I made and hang them up on the refrigerator. <laughs> and my beloved grandmother, Margaret Tyndall, would hang my paintings framed in her house, as my mother did too. And this is as a, as a, as a young child. And they had a huge, at those formations, this is what I've done throughout my life with other people, le- learning from my own experience, is that people approach the creative process with such feelings of trepidation, inferiority, not being good enough, not being talented. And it, it's just so important to support people's authentic expression and, and let them know that it has an impact on you. And, uh, and I think that that started uh, very early for me. And I've tried to I've tried to have that be the driving principle of everything I do, and, and worldwide, because these fears of expression, this vulnerability around the uncertainty about not being good enough, of trying to do it like someone else does it, as opposed to your own unique, authentic way. Um, people need support. In doing that, I think that yeah, I think that's a, a, a really, really important point. It's something that definitely comes across throughout your work. Um, and it sounds like your parents were uh, your first gallerists and uh, early supporters. And do you think that was really important for your, you know, for the foundations of your love of the arts and for your own work? Well, it had a lot to do, but I, I, I believe that what what happened to me really is that as a, as as a child, I was 
I was typical boy interested in ethics and, and other kinds of things. And it was my college education in New York City that uh, where um, the, the university at that point uh, didn't have too much going in the visual arts, classic liberal arts college, the Arts Students League of New York with the support of a professor there. And that, that whole experience in New York City was profoundly formative. I mean, I, 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 had, I had a remarkably influential college education, liberal arts education that has stayed with me to the day. And in that college education, studying people uh, with people like Thomas Berry, uh, you know, the great work, the dream of the earth, and uh, studying Eastern religions with Thomas Berry before he became famous as the echo uh, uh, person. Those ways of thinking about experience, approaching experience, and supporting the world and supporting people had a profound impact. And thank God I, I was not a psychology major. <laughs> as much as I've committed my life to depth psychology and the, the psychology of art, thank God I was, I was not a psychology major because, I mean, I couldn't have done it. And in that day, the psychology department at my college was very quantitative and involved with assessments and testing and oh, oh my goodness that's antithetical yeah uh, to everything I, because there are many psychologies one-sided yeah. quantification business is not what i do and so so the college professors and, and teachers had a huge impact on what happened later i wanted to ask you as well do you feel like being in the city of new york at that time had as much of a profound impact on you, or was it more just a liberal oh, arts education and well, a college? Well, well, the gestalt, James. So right. uh, good job tying the, all of this together from childhood, you know, uh, relatively, um, you know, let's just say insulated childhood in the North Shore of Boston. Uh, right. Uh, uh, so that being, being um, uh, uh, moving to the heart of, uh, uh, of the city, yeah, and um, and it was uh, the the streets of the city, the 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 grit of the city, uh, the the absolute. I used to say that New York City in those days was about as foreign as anything I could ever experience. Yeah, uh, as a child coming from this part of Boston, and so it was profoundly influential. The Gestalt, the whole of the city, finding yeah. your way and um, and making it work as a complete foreigner. In so, my yeah. it, you, if you don't mind me asking, what what was the what were the years that you were living in New York? Uh, 1964 to 1968. So yeah, it must have been a, a real. It magic. was a tumultuous time. Bobby Kennedy yeah. was going to be our commencement speaker, and um, and he was killed days before the commencement. And um, and then in 1968, Martin Luther King was uh, just a, uh, the uh, in in April. It was a uh, it was a. Uh, it was a tumultuous time in, in American history and in world history. And uh, do, do you feel that that's something you've represented through your own art practice? Um, or was that not really a big interest to yours? What, what, what happened to me is that those years in New York, that education, uh, those, um, those movements in the world, you know, made it very clear to me that my art is about service. It's not about me. It's not about the art. Uh, oh my, my goodness! There's such problems with the art world in terms of trends, gimmicks. So my art, my art, always about going back to Thomas Berry, the sacred dimensions of artistic right. experience, right. Right. They're indigenous to the human condition, worldwide, and, universal, and, uh, that transcend uh, cultures, that transcend identity, where art heals throughout history. And art advances a communal experience and social experience. Well, well, my, my art was always uh, committed to that, that social service. Let me take that a little bit further. Impact on the world. You've, 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 um, you've almost taken the words out of my mouth because I know this is something that you're very passionate about. And I've heard you speak on this before, and I always find it you know, I I immensely moving. Um, but just to take that a little bit further then, what for you the arts broadly speaking i know that's a term and a definition that you struggle with as well i believe but how do you define the arts what's what is art to you and what is well, it what is its purpose you know it, i know it's a difficult yeah. question the the immortal question you could say but um 
you know, in, in, you kind of already started to allude to it. So maybe take what you just said a little further. Like, what's the answer to you? Well, th thank you, James, because uh, it's important clarification, because my position, the position of the Journal of Applied Arts and Health, and Ross and the whole team, is that art, A, art, B, yeah. is inclusive of all forms of artistic expression. And a very important distinction. The art forms. And, and, and the visual arts, as I've written recently in the journal, and my beloved visual arts and art therapy and all those other domains have appropriated uh, the, 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 ter the notion of art, which in, in other languages and other histories, uh, I was just in Taiwan and it was reinforced how, the, how, the, uh, how, how in Chinese civilization and languages, how the notion of art was always inclusive of all art forms, the same. Same with German Kunst and, and Kunstlerines and Kunstlers, you know, artists and, 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 and art forms. And, and that is uh, the way I approach artistic expression is all inclusive. And it, it becomes very important when you're working with people because you don't departmentalize the expressions of the body that are fundamental, for example, to painting. And, and, and painting has a dramatic aspect. Uh, it has a movement basis. If you were children painting, who were so influential in my experience. They tell stories while they're painting in response to painting. It, it, it has sound. It, it, every, all the senses are, are, are integral to every form of artistic expression. Well, thank you very much. And again, I can feel the passion. And I always love to hear you speak about these topics. So it's great to have you on here again. Um, but like, um, there's a couple of things I want to just go a little bit deeper into that you are clearly, you know, one of the, the minds that, that, that discusses this the, the most effectively, I think. And to begin with, I'd like to talk about this notion of arts and healing. And, you know, what, what are your kind of main beliefs around this topic? What, what is arts and healing to you? And um, when did your own work start on this? And, and what are your beliefs about it? Well, uh, James, as, as I've written in a number of places, I... I uh, dropped into this wor world of art and therapy, uh, serendipitous, in, uh, in, in 1970, after having dropped out of art school, uh, uh, excuse me, not art school, law school, uh, and, 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 and uh, my, the family work of the law, and, um, and committing myself to art, and very much by coincidence, being hired as an art therapist at a large state mental hospital. And, and I was hired because of that. My grandmother, Tyndall, that I mentioned, who had volunteered at that hospital uh, for, for 20 years. And, and, and as the, person, the personnel director said to me at that time, if you're Margaret Tyndall's grandson, you must be okay. So anyway, I got hired as an art therapist with no background, but with this passion about how art can improve improve life for people living in these these in those days pretty difficult challenging situations in yeah. in state asylums yeah right and so immediately the first goal was was the human dignity uh, that can come from affirming once again affirming as i was affirming affirming people a person's authentic and natural artistic expression so that was always the, the primary is is the recognition of the humanity of the people living in these very the dignity and, and the respect that came from from making that art and having it be witnessed by others and have others have others express to the person making it what it means to them. That art was showed at the Addison Gallery of American Art. It was picked up by the Massachusetts Council of Arts and Humanities. It traveled around the Northeast and major art museums. The dean at the Leslie College Graduate School of Education, then Leslie College, now Leslie University, saw the show and hired me to start an art therapy program. Oh, great. Because so that's he was the moved by what they did. He right. was moved by their humanity and their artistic expression. And in terms of, is that kind of, that sounds, so that's sort of like the genesis and the gestation period of not only your own work. Um, but then that sounds like that's the trajectory of this whole, you know, discipline in a sense, right? So is that kind of where these 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 things formed and became a, a true discipline? Was it was at your time when you were when you were then hired? Is that the the lineage? What happened is that that program that I started 
the 26, 27, exactly 50 years ago, exactly 50 years ago, um, that the program exploded. People came for, you know, from throughout the world, hundreds and hundreds. There are so many, many thousands of graduates working. So, so what we did say it had an impact. And, and of course, what happened is we, I started, you know, through the, the experience uh, uh, there and with people worldwide, started to ask my, consistently ask myself the question of how art heals. I've been asking that question uh, from the fr first day in that mental hospital, as I yeah. said, March of 1970, when I was asked how what I was going to contribute in terms of to others and so so on but the core principle that i've discovered in my experience primarily this this is the basis of the, of the emergence of art based research my own art making i found that art heals i think <laughs> i think i'm troubled when when that, that that process of taking the disturbance taking the difficulty taking the pain in doing something it's through artistic expression, transforming the pain into an affirmation of life that heals. And that's what I see happening uh, consistently uh, in the experience of others. Well, I know this has been your, you know, part of your life's work, and you've you've sort of posed the question I was going to ask uh, almost in that in that statement there. But how have you, has your own thoughts about the healing effects and the healing benefits of art? How has that changed over the years? Or do you still have the same? I mean, have you been evolving it, learning, or, or, or do you still have the same core thoughts and beliefs, values, or have things changed? Those technology has changed and, and convergence has occurred. Do you feel that the evolution is, of arts and health or, you know, arts as a healing practice um, has shifted or is it still similar to what you were working on back there in the, in the seventies? Well, th thank you, James, because, you know, as Heraclitus said, nothing certain but change. Right. Things are changing all the time. And we focus a lot on that. We focus a lot on differences. We don't focus as much in our world today on what what stays, what persists, what what is indigenous, using that word, to the human experience right. everywhere and throughout history. So what I what I've what I've learned, interestingly enough, is that what I said, I'm glad you asked me about how I got started, said in that first interview at Danvers State Hospital has been absolutely consistently uh, affirmed. Right. And that's that's in terms of bringing dignity to the human community, bringing, being, being, having a person seen and supported and witnesses for what they can give to the world. I remember one of the outsider artists that I've worked with said, when I had my first exhibition, people were actually passionate to me. I think one of the things which is really beautiful, contributing though. member, as opposed to, as opposed to a as opposed to a sick, you know, as as we're often labeled uh, as a contributing, positive contributing uh, member uh, to the human community. So uh, I think I think that's uh, one of the things which is beautiful about that is that it's actually relatively simple and has remained relatively simple. Yes, yes, you know. yes. Providing space and dignity, and yeah, I, I, so that's that, that. That's a wonderful answer. Yeah, James, uh, it's simple because, and I've always said, the simpler, the deeper. Right. The simpler, the deeper. Yes, you said about uh, what. What is the basis? Well, the the other basis that I learned from the very start, from the first days that it's been sustained, is the power of working in community. <laughs> always worked in community, together with other people. I've described the community as a slipstream that carries us to places that we're, we can never do alone. Uh, and the community is so significant because most of our lives, communities can be harsh to intimidate. Groups uh, uh, can, can be sometimes painful. So when a community gets behind the artist and supports and affirms, I mean, that's a powerful assisting force. I've always worked in groups, always worked in community. And, and once again, James, in, in terms of you asked me um, about how I've changed, which, which changed, what's happened over the, these 50 plus years, I'm studying this process, and I find that these forces 
And these processes are present throughout human history, and they're consistent. They're always there. Um, I think that's an important tenet, uh, definitely, of your work that we need to, to remember as well. But you, you're asking all the questions that, I'm, I'm, that I was going to pose. So we're on the same wavelength from this, in this interview, that's for sure. My question, next question was to ask you um, that it seems from your work that community and collaboration are vital to not only your work, but your beliefs. And, and you've answered that one, I think. But I wanted to lead on then to, you know, we were talking about 50 years and we're talking about community and collaboration. So I did want to go into, a, you know, to discuss briefly the Journal of Applied Arts and Health, which you've certainly had a key influence on. And I know that that for you is like a key work of collaboration and that there's a real community that's been built around that journal. So perhaps you could just tell us briefly a little bit about just what's the journal in a nutshell in terms of its focus? And then perhaps you could just showcase what Ross Pryor and some of the colleagues there on the editorial team and board are, uh, you know, are doing and what they're doing with your legacy and taking that forward. Thank you again, James, for giving me the opportunity to affirm uh, how, how the Journal of Applied Art and Health is right now, it is my base. You know, I've moved on, uh, you know, from, um, from, uh, being a full-time academic and the journal the journal just resonates with all of my values and and it, and it's it's service to society uh, most importantly uh is having as you've described and i've heard in, in terms of uh, people that that are watching the evolution of the journal having a tremendous impact on the world that's so that's true. that's what i that's what my goal has always been to, to bring art and service to the world. And, and I see this journal as being a primary move. I mean, first of all, when Ross founded this journal, he called it Applied Arts and Health. And, and what he's saying there is that we want to apply the artistic process to, the, to, to public health, to the health of the world. The journal has always welcomed the universal success to art healing as opposed to the very circumscribed uh, dimensions that are happening throughout the world of professional associations, actually limiting at often furthering exclusion rather than the inclusion that they say they strive for. Professions are very important. I've been very involved in the American Art Therapy Association as president. But I think that what we need to be doing in the professional domains is lead, to lead the world in, in making artistic expression universally accessible to people everywhere, to welcoming artists into this community of practice and giving them support. Some, some of us have studied this uh, for years and we work in community and, and helping others uh, and, and supporting them and making their own contributions. The same goes for volunteers. But the work is not necessarily circumscribed uh, around just professional practices. As I, as I say in my book, Art Heals, Art Heals inside and outside there. It, he, it heals everywhere. And I believe the Journal of Applied Arts and Health represents this purpose. It also minimizes these silos of the different, different art forms, dance therapy, art therapy, music therapy, poetry therapy, that don't even talk to one another. Do you think that's partly about the professionalization of, of academia and of right. you know scholarly communities and 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 the need right. to be definables and metrics and 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 I think to just lead on from that uh, to answer yes. to take yes. my own question and run is we we were talking um, previously um, about the journal and I think it's a great proponent of what we call real world impact and that's a term that we're using a lot in journal publishing these days. Because this journal is very successful and it's, you know, celebrating its 10th anniversary and we're looking, you know, we have high citations and, and the, the journal has academic impacts. But more than that, it's one of the groundbreaking journals in terms of pushing real world impact. So who's using it? Is it affecting policy? You know, is it changing people's opinions? Is it being used by therapists, by artists? Is it communicating and creating a community where people can, you know, can, can have these conversations evolve and exist? And I think that's one of, for me, one of the reasons that the journal is so successful, struck such a nerve when it was first published and, and, and remains so relevant is because it's really focusing on having real world impact 
to a wide range of people from different communities around the arts, rather than being simply focused about on, on sort of data and citations and silos. And I think it really does break down some of those uh, academic boundaries and barriers, which, you know, are, are sort of inevitable, but, but nevertheless can get in the way of genuine conversation. Uh, James, as, uh, as Molly Bloom said, uh, in, in Ulysses, in a very different context, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I didn't uh, think we were yes, 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 yes. You, you, you just, uh, I think, uh, you, you said it beautifully. The, the academic turf war, uh, dimensions are, are all economically driven. They're economically driven as Stanley Cobb said about the bifurcation of mind and body, the great psychiatrist has said that you don't separate mind and body. I mean, that's, he said, that's an administrative affair between the physiology department and the psych. You know, it's, these are administrative affairs, as he said, they're economic, economic systems uh, that need to support themselves. And they're part of reality. And I accept that. Remember, I, I ran one of them. For many years, the, the business has to work and higher education has to work. But my core values in terms of impact are democratic, are yeah. truly inclusive, yeah. honestly inclusive. And that's what the Journal of Applied Arts and Health does. It is, a, it is an all-inclusive journal that does its best to transcend uh, the silos. Of course, all the silos are now. Yeah. Disciplines are important. It's more about building bridges, right? Well, it's 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 disciplines. Take, take medicine, for example. Of course, disciplines and specializations, but we're part of something bigger. In in art, not science. I, I think that's an interesting distinction and one that a lot of people will possibly argue against. But I think that's just an important bit of food for thought, and we can just put a pin in that. But I think that that's a really important statement you've just made. And one. Want to be anti-science in any way and i'm writing about that right now but art and science complement one another art art is about opening to the un, unexpected the and of course science has that dimension to it but in, in art we are not we are not trying to replicate we are the opposite we're trying to always express the unique well, I want to just also just, I'm going to jump around a little bit because obviously we're on limited time and talking a bit more about the journal, not only have you had your own special issue recently, but you've also had a special issue 14.3 of the Journal of Applied Arts and Health, which was titled Celebrating Sean McNair. So I just wanted to ask you briefly, I know you've responded in a different format, but I mean, that must be, uh, feel like a real honor and very much deserved, but do you have any um, words on that? Do you have any response? And I mean, like you say, 50 years in the making, so probably about time, actually. But I mean, a wonderful, wonderful um, special issue. But how do you feel about that? Well, uh, uh, James, well, first of all, I was shocked <laughs> <laughs> because it was uh, kept as a complete surprise. And um, and, and as I've said, I said, I was stunned by the extent to which the, gr the group of authors, the community of authors, community of creation said it better than me. There's something to be said uh, of bouncing off one another and seeing that what you said, what I wrote or what I might have said, had an impact on these 10 other authors. And that's what it's all about. It's all about these multiplications. And, and they provided evidence. That journal provided evidence that this guy sitting here said or he says something over there and it has an impact on the community. And then the members of the community impact others. That's that's what's happened with this work. That's what's happening with the journal. People read, get inspired, and they go out and they do it in their own unique ways. I mean, this is a this is something that the journal supports, and, and it's a distinguishing feature of what I I promote in the use of art and therapy, the use of art and healing. I, I totally discourage doing it like I do it. Do it. You know, I, I have my own ways of doing everything. And I say to my students, please don't, don't imitate me. Don't do it my way. Study me. Criticize me. What, what do you find that, that I'm doing might influence you? What, do you? what is different than what you might do? But then do it your way. That, now, James, that's a defining quality of art. 
And that's where art complements is the uniqueness of each expression and the uniqueness of each person. And, and, and the work I do is really discourages system, systematic uh, um, institutionalization of a particular person's way of doing something, which is, a, which is going strong throughout the world. And I need to uh, keep challenging that. It's going strong within our community. It's going strong with many of the readers of this journal. Where basic, well, people basically follow systems uh, uh, introduced by other people in a in a relatively fixed way. I say study those systems, study them carefully, but then do it your way. I think that's a, a beautiful point, well made. And I would just like to take this uh, opportunity, really, just to just to, again just to highlight the journal to our to anyone watching this. Um, if you go to intellectbooks.com or just Google. The Journal of Applied Arts and Health, you'll find some free content there and open access content and things that you can read. Um, it really is a wonderful journal and there's been a great special issue uh, on Sean and there's been a lot of wonderful work coming out for a decade or more in that journal. And of course, there's always an open call for papers and we're always looking for those unique voices and for people to submit their own take on perhaps the work yes. and systems yes. that Sean's been involved with yes. or involved in breaking down. So I just urge everyone to check out the Journal of Applied Arts and Health, and also check out the work of Ross Pryor and the other people involved in the journal, because they're also taking the work of Sean McNiff and other people and have forwarded it and taking it to another dimension. And there's some fantastic scholarship coming out from all of the other people involved in the journal. So I'd really advocate for them as well. Some great books and things from, from each of those people. Um, so I would urge people to take a look at that, especially if they're interested in, you know, sort of maybe um contesting their own beliefs around art or the arts well i have another couple of topics i'd like to talk about today and i wanted to talk about this notion that you're also kind of famous for um this notion of art as research which of course is the title of a seminal book published with intellect and i know that it's a topic that you you flirted with discussed and focused on for, for for much of your your life but at the same time this this, this topic is now something that's in common parlance we hear it all the time uh, uh, academic conferences, in journal articles, um, among art practitioners, um, and beyond the academy and all these other things. But but what is, for the layman, what is art as research? How would you define it? What does it mean to you? Well, well James, I would say um, very simply that we describe art as research, aka also known as art-based research, is the use of artistic expression as a primary mode of inquiry by the person doing the research, either alone or with others. <laughs> that, is, uh, that is a definition uh, that has taken shape over the years because I've been asked this question uh, very often uh, 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 since the publication of uh, art-based research uh, published in London, actually. Uh, in 1998, which, which which just stimulated a whole new new career dimension uh, for me in terms of the response to that book. The book was originally intended for the art therapy community because, because of what you um, said about the quantitative impact factors. I was going, I was noticing in the journals, the various journals, that I was being cited uh, around what I had written. Uh, the, through the late 70s, the 80s, around uh, research in terms of freedom and inquiry and, the, and artistic psychology and a more art-based approach to everything. And I said, well, you know, I think I should write a book about this. And to my shock, the book was never really adopted so much by the art therapy uh, graduate programs because they're so, they're so, let's just say they're on another plane. But it appealed to other professions, you, you know, yeah, comprehensive disciplines beyond therapy in the in the in that whole realm of art as research has 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 taken on. Now, what I, what I think I what that book did is it's put it put its finger on something that had been there throughout yeah. time. Gino, Neil said, you know, authors were psychology psychology existed in the thing I make as a researcher. There's a sense within the art. And it, there's an intelligence at work, and that art doesn't have to justify itself through something other than itself. That's the fundamental premise of art-based research. And it, 
it's a complement to science. It's not anti-science, but it brings something different. It's, it goes to places where science does not. Well, let me let me ask you a question that I think you've really posed yourself over the years, but it'd be good to get your perspective, especially right now in this moment um, in the world, and, and um, that is really um, what. Do you see as the opportunities and challenges in arts-based research, especially, like I say, at the moment? Well, uh, the, um, the 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 opportunity is to make full use of the artistic intelligence and impact on the world, <laughs> and to and to promote uh, the use of artistic expression in in, in public health worldwide. Now, the way you do that, as I keep saying, is you show the art evidence. You show what the art does. Just as I told that story about the dean of the graduate school seeing the exhibit we put together, it was at Harvard at that time, he went and saw it, and he saw the evidence. He saw what people could do, and it had an impact on him, a profound impact on him. There you go, right back to the beginning. And that's what we have to do. We have to, in this evidence-based uh, discourse that's dominating research today, the evidence is just not numbers. No, the I, evidence I, is empirical. It is the, look at the art, look at the art, open to it and let it move you. I feel like in a nutshell, I think, I'm, forgive me if I'm misquoting you, but once I think this is attributed to you. Just a simple statement that art is the evidence is something I feel like you're alluding to. Um, and that snapshot, that nugget there, I think is something that sort of... So the, uh, the term was crystallized at the 10th anniversary of the Journal of Applied Arts and Health right. in Alfred. And I gave, a, 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 I gave a, one of the keynotes at the conference uh, in Telford, and, and, uh, and it was focused on art is the evidence. And, and Mitchell Kosick, uh, Again, one of the, the associate of the journal, you know, is a musician. He got up at the closing of the conference and led the group in a, in a musical, dramatic, uh, chanting uh, uh, expression of art as the evidence closing out that conference. So I think let's just say that notion holds our community together. Wonderful. Well, that's that's a wonderful place to, I think, to leave that and to to move on. And one of the questions I do want to ask you as well. Um, you have been profoundly influential on many, um, but I wanted to ask you who have who have been some of the key influences on you, whether they be artists oh, or, or 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 people who have maybe in, influenced your own thinking. It clearly sounds like perhaps your 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 parents and grandparents were important initially because of them providing you with the uh, you know the affirmation to to pursue art, um, which seems to have struck a chord and and followed through in much of your own research and your own practice. But yeah, who's been your who's influenced you? Well, that, that uh, James, wonderful question, and, uh, uh, and and another one that can help us tie things together. And, and let's just say art is the evidence. Uh, th that point. Well, what I also want to say about that: if art is the evidence, then those of us doing art-based research have to show the evidence effectively. We have to we have to show the art effectively so that it speaks to people and has has an influence on people. And that brings me to my primary influence, who was my mentor, Rudolf Arnheim, uh, the great founder of the psychology of art, whose fundamental principle coming out of Gestalt Psychology at the University of Berlin is that the artwork expresses itself. It holds expression. Here I am. It holds expression in itself. And so the forms express themselves. And so we have to do the best we can to, to present that evidence in a way that impacts people. And, and of course, Arnheim's work is based, based on that premise. He is a professor, professor of the psychology of art at Harvard, and he, had, he adopted me in the early 1970s. And that's a whole other story about how I got connected to him. And, and he, me in my early work in developing, as he said, a psychology that keeps the smell of the studio. <laughs> it, it is a psychology that's post art, a psychology that's art based. So he was a major influence. James Hillman, 
uh, through my friend Howard McConaughey at the University of New Mexico uh, was another. Uh, I, 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 Howard came to me in the 1980s and he saw something I wrote about James Blake and he said, anyone that mentions James Blake is good with me. He introduced me to James Hillman and that's just a whole other. That's just a whole other huge uh, primary influence. I met, I met Jim uh, in, in 1980, and um, and God bless them, but both of them, uh, Jim are no longer with us, but they've been massive influence. Well, and I, and I know we, to bring it back full circle, um, we started off by talking about Massachusetts and how that's been a place that's always been uh, in your heart, a locale you've, you've often returned to and lived in and have been educated in and all these other things. But of course, your work has taken you around the world. So I wanted to just finish off really by by asking, has place had a big impact on your art practice or on your beliefs? Has travel impacted you much? Um, do you consider yourself sort of a, a man of the world and, 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 and has visiting different cities um, really guided you and influenced you. You mentioned Berlin, you mentioned New York, we talked about Massachusetts. Um, are you more of a studio head? Uh, gee, my goodness, that's a whole, but James, that's a great question. That's, that's a, you're, you're testing my ability to be simple and terse. It's, <laughs> you are, I'm just right. <laughs> but uh, who was it? Diogenes Laertes uh, described himself as a citizen of the world. Uh, Margaret Mead uh, picked up on that too, and many others. So yes, I've always viewed myself in that way, and I've always had huge love and respect for the people of the world, the human community. And, I, and it's, a, it's a pain to me today, the way we separate. You know, people constantly ask me, because I, I've been able to work so uh, much throughout the world, and, you know, constantly, more outside the United States in many, many ways than in it. And uh, people are always asking, how are people different artistically? And of course, there are differences. There are infinite differences. But, I, but what I say is that no one ever asks me how people are the same. You know, what we share. So that's been my major life focus. Infinite differences in keeping with art. Not categorical group. Because we, we take away a person's uniqueness when we people in buckets well, shared humanity with infinite differences and in response to your other question um y yes i'm constantly influenced and inspired by those differences in place they 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 rework my own inner stuckness and chemistry and they open me to things beyond the habitual ways and you see that in my books. You see it in Art is Medicine, the art I made when teaching at Vienna, and art made in response to the Iraq War. And of course, I have this long history, 50 times uh, uh, traveling to Israel and start helping to start a graduate program there. So yes, huge influence from the people of the world and what those influences, those thousands of people that I've worked with throughout the world impacted on me is what we share well i think that's a pertinent and impactful place to end this interview today i just want to say thank you so much for joining me on in conversation it's been an absolute pleasure and i uh, really enjoyed talking with you especially it's always great to have uh, you're so emphatic with your answers and it's always great to have that energy so i really do appreciate your time and i just wanted to say to our audience if anyone wants to find out more about uh, this research or the arts and health Sean's work, Sean's website is a great place to start. So do go Google Sean McNiff um, and then maybe find your way over to the Intellect website as well. Check out intellectbooks.com and you'll find more contributions from Sean. And of course, you'll find the Journal of Applied Arts and Health, um, which is definitely taking your legacy and moving it forward. And of course, check out people like Ross Pryor and others who are working very much at the forefront of the coalface of, uh, of, of, of this discipline and moving this world forward. So, Sean, thank you so much. Do you have any final final comments or anything you'd like to say before we uh, draw this to a close? James, this has been delightful talking with you. You've been inspirational in your questions. And yes, I do always have to work on curbing my enthusiasm, <laughs> as the great Larry David uh, uh, would say. But uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, to, thank you to you, James, and all of the intellect community.
the editors, uh, Ross, Mitchell, Teresa, Bethan, who supports the journal and the intellect team. And thank you to our intellect community, uh, going back to Masood, who, who first uh, supported our work. And, um, and I just am um, just proud to be associated with, your, with what you are all doing.